Thanks for staying, everyone, as Kenny mm -hmm. said before. Um, we know that um, the scheme has been running, going back to Murray's point, this is uh, going back to another long-term project, particularly well-funded um, in the recent past. Um, what we're going to talk to you about today is our evaluation results. So we're going to put the project into context, tell you about what we've been doing over the last six years, and tell you what we're going to be doing next. We know some of you will have seen some of this bit before, because as you'll see but later on, we've done a lot of talks over the last six years. But we checked, and it's never been done in this order, and, they have, and some <laughs> of these sites um, have not been talked about before. So, just to put it back into context a little bit, um, so we're from Archaeology Scotland, obviously we're the um, actual charity in Scotland for education and conservation. We are... This is the main strand of what we do. We basically have three main strands, education, promotion, and support. And Adopt a Monument basically fits across all three of them. Um, it's a very long-term project in many ways. Um, first started in the early 90s uh, with no official support. Um, the, kind of, the scheme kind of faded away in the late 90s after a number of projects had been completed and was reinstigated again in 2006 with um, or Scotland funding as it was at the time, um, when six projects were completed. I started um, in 2009, I think, um, to basically look at what we can do with the scheme. Can we make it bigger? Um, how can we support more groups, more projects, more sites? And we put together a big package to, uh, to the HLF and we were successful. And we began in 2011. It says on there 2016 is when we finished, but we had an extra year, um, generously funded by HESS. Um, and we aim to work for, with 55 groups in two parts, 40 um, what we call traditional projects, so conservation stewardship projects, and 15 outreach projects, so working with new audiences or doing something a little bit differently. Um, we had all sorts of aims in there about um, you know, education and training, support, um, many of you people, were, many people in the audience were involved at this initial stage, setting the project up. Um, and the, a lot of the usual things were put into place. So we had a strategy for education resources, interpretation resources at sites. Um, so as Phil said, in 2011, Archaeology Scotland was awarded um, Heritage Lottery funding, um, and also which is match funded by Historic Scotland money, um, leader money, um, and um, we also, in I think 2015, uh, got some M money from SSE as well. Um, I joined the project in 2011 when the HLF um, phase of the project started. Um, and as um, you can see, we actually um, vastly um, overperformed um, to our detriment, a personal detriment, I think, at times. But um, we actually um, completed 71 projects instead of the original 55 we meant. So that's a further 16 projects than we were meant to do. Um, but that's bearing in mind that we've never actually advertised the project um, widely. Um, and we still have about 70 to 100 projects on a waiting list um, where, again, groups are getting in touch and they want to be involved with the um, with the, the scheme and we hope to take those forward at some at some point um, and the other huge leap that we um, not I wouldn't say over delivered but we originally set out to do 20 training workshops and we ended up doing 79 training workshops so that's a huge increase of um, I mean we've completely I think you know the way we actually delivered the project was slightly different I think to how we originally set out we were going to do it um, and Phil's going to elaborate a little bit more on that but what you can see from here is the type of projects that groups, community groups, have come to us um, asking to be, um, if we can help get them involved with. And it's such a huge range of monument types here. Um, and I think that's really where you can see the flexibility of Adopt a Monument, um, that we are able to accommodate um, pretty much almost anything. That if, if a community group or community members are interested in engaging with their local heritage, um, I, I was thinking yesterday evening, I can't think of a project we've said no to. We've maybe perhaps supported groups to um, reframe their project ideas to, make, um, to, make, uh, to fit in with the heritage site. Some ideas that groups come to don't quite fit into the heritage frameworks for those particular sites. But certainly, I mean, we just accept anything um, because that's the great thing about Adopt a Monument. It's community-led. 
So we're just here to basically facilitate that engagement and to support our groups to make their projects happen. It's up to them what they want to adopt and how, to a certain extent, how they want to adopt it. So we thought we'd just go through a few um, of the um, projects, the sort of the more traditional projects, to show the sort of type of activities that we've been helping groups with. Um, and this one, um, I apologise if any of you have seen this example before, it was one of our first projects um, and it was delivered in partnership with um, NOSAS, North of Scotland Archaeology Society. And they were all um, already working with Scotland's Rural Pass, um, that was a community um, archaeology project delivered by the Royal Commission. Um, and basically, after they had engaged with SRP to um, record this um, township, they were keen to um, go back to the township and um, basically um, promote it as a site to visit um, in that local area. It's in the Black Isle, on the Black Isle, um, just north of Inverness. So we, using <coughs> European money from our leader grant, we supported the group to create a leaflet um, about the site um, that they're able to distribute um, widely within the Inverness area. And we also worked with the landowner um, to get um, temporary fencing up. Um, Morris, the landowner, who was just a fantastic supporter of the project, um, really quite liked using um, the field at this township in for his pigs. Um, and obviously pigs um, and archaeology doesn't quite go at times. So by supplying Morris with a temporary electric fence, he was actually able to just fence off the archaeology whenever he was chucking the pigs or placing the pigs in the field, I should say. There were no chucking of pigs, I can promise that. Um, so again, it was actually, on, on the bare bones of it, a very simple project that actually has huge benefits for helping to preserve and conserve this site. Cullensbroch um, up in Shetland is another interesting project. Um, we actually, well, the Adopt a Monument scheme worked with this project in, I think, 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. But they were quite keen to um, receive a bit more training um, because they, since they had engaged with the scheme uh, in uh, 26, um, they had new members that weren't trained in doing perhaps archaeology survey um, and, um, and uh, various sort of uh, recording activities. Now, this project actually um, was included in the Accord project, and that was a partnership project that we did with Glasgow School of Arts. Um, and we basically, we worked with um, five of our adopter monument groups were taught how to digitally record their projects, uh, sorry, their sites. So by using very um, simple and accessible software, um, we've actually got digital models now of a lot of our sites that the groups have produced them themselves. And it was really great for us and our groups to be part of that research led project because it got us trained in how to do data gathering in this way and it got our groups trained as well. Um, and this is one of the models that our groups um, produced of their um, of their um, of the manse that building is called within the township, and we went back up as well and helped them record that township as well. And the value of producing sort of I suppose different products like this um, is they have a small heritage centre. Um, this is on Bressa. Um, it's just opposite from Lerwick, um, and they have a small heritage centre there. Cullensbroch Township is actually on the opposite side of the island and it previously used to get very little footfall. And by um, using sort of mediums like this in the Heritage Centre, they were actually able to start increasing the footfall to, uh, footfall to their township on the other side of the island um, from tourists and visitors um, who, who were coming, who were coming to, to see and take a look. Yeah, so a few prehistoric sites. Um, so this is... Sordal and Arden Merkin, and this was again another collaboration with an academic um, project, but also taking in the local community. Um, it was a project that hadn't really engaged with the community at the time, and we did very you know, standard things of vegetation management and plans with the estate. We worked quite heavily with the estate in terms of how the site could be looked after. Um, some interpretation was developed with the community group, but I think in the, in the, in the round it's quite a, quite a traditional project in the sense it's in this case, it's Neolithic Chambered Cairn. Um, we did a lot of training in terms of field survey, vegetation management, as, as I said. But it developed the growth of a community group which went on to adopt another two projects on the peninsula and developed their own oral history project, which they got um, Heritage Lottery funding for, um, and to develop their own website. So it's actually gone on to be quite a big factor in the growth of a, a completely new group. 
Um, Regmore um, up in Inverness is a slightly different case in the sense this site had been moved um, ahead of development of a of the road. Um, was it in the seventies? Yeah, A nine. Yeah. yeah, the A nine. Yeah. We drive over it. You all drive over it. <laughs> the site of this poor little monument. Um, and it basically, it was in a park, and there's a bit disused. Uh, there's rubbish in there, and a few fires. The things have been lit for people drinking. Um, and the community council approached us to basically just see if we could make the site a bit more accessible. Um, as I say, it's in a public park, so um, that was quite straightforward in the sense of the <coughs> vegetation management, all that kind of stuff, a bit of cleaning up. But again, the group developed their own story about the site and produced, made themselves a, a lovely interpretation board for local people to see as they walked through the park. And they've been using the site um, with the schools and education resource, so outside learn, outdoor learning. And this one uh, finally is uh, in cahoots with Murray over there. Um, Torwood Brock uh, was funded by the Forestry Commission and brought together by the local authority archaeologists Murray and Sterling and Jeff in the uh, Falkirk. And basically, this was a quite different for us in the sense that it didn't really involve a traditional group or a group that was geographically located. But the many of the things we did very similar in terms of vegetation management, landowner permissions and a laser scan by AOC. Um, but the other thing that we were very keen to do is not only support um, the existing community groups out there, it was also trying to get um, new audiences involved in archaeology. So we were trying to do things a little bit differently. Um, and we were greatly inspired by some of the work that had been um, going on down south um, by Gloucestershire um, County archaeologists and also um, Dr Rachel Kiddy, who now has her PhD, who looked at homeless heritage. So working with um, transient um, people um, in Bristol and recording the places and spaces that they were living in in Bristol. So we developed um, 15 um, what we called outreach projects which were designed to engage with audiences that had never been involved in archaeology or heritage before but perhaps would, would like to, to be involved with. And we've done projects with crisis, young carers, um, women's aid, I'll come back to um, We've done additional support needs, um, we've done um, at-risk people, but we, we've just worked with so many project partners in, around, in and around Scotland, and it's been a really wonderful outcome from ADOPT um, and for Archaeology Scotland to be able to expand our heritage audiences in this way. So one of the projects we worked with was in Dundee. Um, this was an environmental project um, called Dicty Connect, and um, they were very established um, in working along the Dicty River and using the Dicty River to connect communities along, along that waterway. And they wanted to start looking at the archaeology um, and got in touch with us. Um, what we found was that there was very little archaeology um, recorded along the Dicty River, um, despite it being an absolute hothouse of milling uh, in the 18th and 19th century. There was incredible map evidence for lots and lots of um, archaeological features. Um, a lot of this had been dis um, destroyed in the post-war expansion of Dundee, but by um, working with um, local communities and one of the local high schools, we actually found lots of um, little features, ancillary features, along the Dicty River that we recorded. Um, and in particularly, we um, worked with a um, local class um, with the high school. These were young people that were regularly excluded from school um, and we got them out doing field survey um, along the Dicty River. We started by recording graffiti um, on um, heritage features around the, um, around the Dicty River. And then um, once we'd learned how to record things in um, a sort of heritage way, um, we then moved on to the heritage features. Um, the picture just in the middle there is actually a category B listed build, um, B listed bridge. And the kids weren't that interested in it until we said, no, we're recording the graffiti rather than the old bridge. But then we went on to record the bridge. So it was a nice little way of getting um, people involved in their local heritage as well. I think only one child fell into the river, so that was really good. Um, so um, we've also done project, uh, projects with um, Russia's Women's Aid. Um, this was a project to, uh, looking at a World War II airbase um, up in the Highlands. Um, and we became a weekly sort of workshop for um, a women's aid group um, based in Dingwall. 
And um, they had already been looking at sort of gender roles in society. So we um, recorded archaeologically this World War II airbase, but we also looked at the gender roles of women who had served there on the site. So not only did we do archival research into the role of women who had served on site, but we also did um, oral history collection. We managed to locate um, one Wren who had served on site um, and went and interviewed her and talked about her. And this was absolutely such a lovely project. We got a little bit of additional funding for this. So we delivered about 16 workshops. Um, and what was really nice is some of our participants had been moved to Dingwell, um, Dingwall, relocated um, to um, escape um, re past relationships. And they found that this heritage project allowed them to explore um, their new landscape. And they, they basically, they managed to sort of um, find, basically identify with aspects of their new landscape. And it just started to, I suppose, make them feel a bit more at home. Um, so that, that was a really great project to do, we think so. Um, we also did Digging the Jimmy. Um, Phil is a very big football fan. I'm surprised it hasn't come up yet. Um, but um, we um, have been looking at trying to do sort of sporting heritage projects um, throughout um, the scheme. And Digging the Jimmy excavated a park in the middle of Edinburgh looking for St Bernard's um, football ground. St Bernard's was the third biggest team in Edinburgh behind um, Hibs and Hearts. Um, and so we excavated some trenches um, through this um, in the wooded area of a park um, with Step Forward, who works with veterans um, in Scotland, and again with Crisis. We went out of Crisis again. Um, and um, we didn't actually find any evidence of the football. I was devastated. It's footballing ground. Um, but what we did find evidence of is the um, park was used as a sort of storage ground for World War II. Um, was it ambulance service? Mm. Yeah. So when we actually found evidence of that occupation of the site. So that was really, really quite interesting. Um, and I think the thing with these sort of new audience projects is um, the three examples I've shown you were quite large scale in terms of they were sort of they were either an intensive five days ex excavation or they were 14 weeks of work. But we found also that small scale um, interventions can also really reap benefits. So we've done work with Bernardo's in Falkirk, where we've done day workshops with at risk children um, exploring the Antonine Wall. Um, I've, you know, I've taken along um, Samian wear so they can get to like up close and personal with Roman artifacts, things that usually they may see in a museum if they go to a museum. Um, and really just get them excited about the amazing archaeology that's out on their doorstep. Um, and even if it's just a bit of relief for a couple of hours, then that, that's fine. But it's um, lovely seeing the transformation of people when they come through the door and when they leave through the door. Yeah, so as, um, we just, as I said before, we just had our evaluation completed by Hall Aitken. And as Cara said, one of the major outcomes is how we can and do deliver projects, that how well, how we should shape the project going forward in terms of delivery. And all the things you've just seen, I think, were very positively um, thought of and will continue, but it's been help, helped us to hone a few of our own ideas. And we're just going to go through a few of those points now. For instance, so the training, we delivered a lot of training. Um, <coughs> mostly, training was delivered on the sites um, to particular groups, sometimes a couple of groups together. But we did try to deliver training regionally, especially in the Highlands and in the on the, the north uh, west coast but we never really managed to get that going as a as a, th a thing as a an, you know, an outcome training was kind of ha ad hoc we had a big training plan when we applied for the funding particular topics that people w had said they wanted when we went for the application but as, as the project moved along technology shifted really quickly in terms of people using their tablets for much more things than they did when we first put the funding application in <laughs> In terms, so the, that had to change, and I guess one of the things that we need to look at in the future going forward is how the training is delivered. And a couple of things have come out of the project already, in terms of short intervention projects like the Torwood Brock here, but we've just done now again over in Ar Argyll and Agnamara, um, the Upper Bridge with the Forestry Commission. There's those little projects that are just provide a little bit of engagement and a little bit of training that I think are, are quite nice um, things to do. But there's but we've also been working on other things, such as whether we should develop an adopt monument camp or several camps throughout the year that we can draw groups together, perhaps regionally or nationally. The geographical scope, I suppose, is projects in Dunfish and Galloway and in Shetland. It's quite difficult. So 
are you know and could they be themed along terms of like conservation or funding or project management whatever it would be technology um and one of the developments from it which has already been working um or testing so recently is our graveyard projects and a number of you've been um out with us in lanarkshire and uh places on the Clyden Valley and Landscape Partnership Projects, where we put together a package of ourselves and um, other professionals to um, look at graveyards more in the whole, more in the round. A big outcome was the contact point. Just being there was um, very highly valued. And we still get many inquiries from new groups and old groups. Um, uh, for instance, some of the groups on Mull, I was just out there a couple of weeks ago. Um, we had three projects on Mull. And I met people from all three projects, and they were very early ones from 2011. Um, we did a lot of talks, um, and yeah, leaflets <laughs> and publicity and things. But again, I think one of the outcomes would be whether that would be structured slightly differently going forward. Um, we know that other projects, similar projects, have been using things like WhatsApp to communicate with monks groups and um, to organize events and maybe that would help uh, rather than just you know the traditional email cara pointed out before at lunchtime that there were no tweets while she was on mater maternity which <laughs> is probably my fault <laughs> um, yeah. I, was only so, off, yes. I was only off for about four months but i just noticed last night there was a big blank <laughs> no tweeting activity so yeah we need to look into that i guess <laughs> staff training film yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry um one of the benefits of getting external evaluators in to look at the scheme was that um, our groups actually said things to the evaluators that they maybe wouldn't say to our faces, good and bad. Um, but these are some of the really nice things that our groups have said. Um, and I think one thing we, again, going forward, um, we totally underestimated the value of brand and the value of, um, to our groups, of being part of the Adopt a Monument scheme. And, you know, so many of the groups have said that it was enabled them to either leverage more funding, um, permissions to do a project or support. Um, it allowed them to get more members of their community involved simply by just being part of, of, of the scheme. And I think that's just something until it came out in the evaluation, that is something we had not considered at all. Um, and that's really lovely, I think, to, to see them, the value, um, them value it in that way. Um, and, I, you know, obviously these are all lovely, positive and um, positive bits of feedback. We did get some um, uh, points to improve, perhaps, feedback. And, but that was mainly down to the capacity. Um, we are a team of, well, we were a team of two and a half um, members of staff. Um, and we, from time to time, that went up to three full-time members of staff. Um, but I think we, going forward, we need to be a bit better at being honest with the groups about what our level capacity is at the time and our ability to react quickly to sites, perhaps, would you say, I think. And that's, that's just ways, again, just seeing it black and white from the groups is just making us reevaluate how we deliver the scheme going forward. Um, oh, we wanted to also highlight our lovely staff. Um, so we've worked with some fantastic people over the last um, six years um, and um, it, you know none of this work could take place if we didn't have these fantastic people um, on um, helping us out um, and we're also really um, we've been really supported by the Archaeology Scotland Board, um, the Adopt Monument Steering Group um, and also our fellow colleagues at Archaeology Scotland as well who again just we couldn't do this work without them there um, supporting us all. Volunteers, yes, um, and you know, again, we couldn't do any of this without our lovely volunteers. Um, they dedicate so much volunteer time to get these projects moving, to get them done. Um, and um, again, the power of the volunteer is something, I'm not sure we underestimated, but we, again, we couldn't get these projects done without um, them doing this in their spare time. And I think we wanted to um, show this slide because again, it demonstrates how many organizations and project partnerships we need in order to take a Doctor Monument forward and, and in order to do a Doctor Monument and to take it forward. And it's a very diverse um, list as well in that we've got very sort of traditional heritage organisations um, supporting us. And then we've got more locally based um, uh, organisations that again, um, that can help us facilitate projects, help us find audiences for some of the projects and take them forward in that way. And we, 
something that you know we, we've really been working towards I think in the last few years is looking at how we are actively delivering the archaeology strategy we're so lucky in Scotland that we have the archaeology strategy I think it's something that can really knit all of the work that you've seen presented today it can knit it all together um, and again one thing we really we're really proud of Adopt, for Adopt is it's actually delivering all of those five outcomes throughout um, the, the the work that all our volunteers and um, and we do. Um, and again, that's something that's really, really good to see, I think. Thanks. Yeah, um, and penultimately, um, so DOPT is now, many of you are probably already aware, but it's now operating in Finland and in the Republic of Ireland um, as pilot projects that we had visits um, from the organisations, Tampere Museum and the Heritage Council in Ireland. Um, and they've basically taken what is our model and testing it in their, in their countries, different, different um, legal frameworks, but they're having very positive results. There's been many, many inquiries from elsewhere in Europe, um, and I think that's something we're going to follow up very soon. Um, but I think from, our, from the evaluation about where we go next, I think there's, there's close to 100 projects on the waiting list, and we get queries all the time, inquiries all the time. Um, so it's, it's basically what we do about that and how we Development project going forward, um, and I guess a lot of it would comes down to capacity, but it also comes down to being a bit more strategic, perhaps. Um, which we've already already started along that line with things like camps and thematic training programs. But I think we're also looking at a lot of the work we've done has been about health and well-being, and it's been about skills development. We work with um, Scotland White Waste Trust on Canal College, living their um, employability program, and. We are in the process of developing our own um, project mm -hmm. um, that will take in both those elements, health, well-being and training, employability. So I think there's been many positive things that have come out of the scheme over the last, well, 20 years, but over the last, this HLF funded project um, that we need to uh, distill and develop further. And I think that's been the main issue, hasn't it? Is we've, been, we've been able to impact so many sites and so many diverse audiences that I think it's wrapping that up into a more complete agenda. And I think all that's left really to say is to thank the funders. Um, as Cara mentioned them all at the beginning. Yeah. Thank you.